had an annual uh, basketball game with our rival school, uh, Brent. And we all went up on the train to a place called De Mortis, and then we took the bus up the zigzag road uh, under the mountains to Baguio for our big game. Well, that was a very exciting weekend because American School was playing Brett School in basketball. And uh, we were welcome up there, and, and the kids had a great time. Uh, it was a wonderful game, great game. And that was on Saturday. On Sunday, December 7th, um, there was to be an air raid drill in Baguio. And everybody, the sirens would sound and everybody had to take cover. Well, we didn't think that would be too exciting. So uh, we thought we'd go to the movies. Mrs. Croft, who was the principal and the chaperone, we asked her permission if we'd go to the movies. So it fell on me to do the call. So I called the Baguio Hotel where she was staying. I asked Mrs. Croft if it was all right if we went to the movies, and she said, fine. It was December 7th in the morning. And then I said, Mrs. Croft, are we at war yet? In other words, the situation was so tense that morning that it was perfectly rational for an eighth grade student to ask, are we at war yet? And she replied, I don't think so. We had a one big party, celebration party that night at the country club after the basketball game. We had all our dates there and uh, just a great time. And then the next morning, we said farewell to our fellow schoolmates. And uh, we got back to Manila, and uh, then Pearl Harbor happened, and then we got bombed. About three o'clock in the morning, my father came into the room, and he was always a very calm person, you know, and, uh, didn't really register at first. And he woke me up. He said, Cliff, son, you should know we're at war. I remember because that was December 8th in the Philippines, Immaculate Conception. It was a holiday. And uh, I remember we, when we turned on the radio, Pearl Harbor was bombed. It was being announced. We interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin. The Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, by air, President Roosevelt has just announced. Boy, that was such a blow. But it really didn't dawn on us how serious that was. It seemed so far away. And we had never uh, anticipated that we would have a conflict breaking out on our shores in the Philippines. <laughs> in Manila in January 1941. By early December 1941, my father uh, was quite certain that a Japanese attack was imminent. And on December 7th, 1941, uh, he sent my mother and me uh, up to Baguio, uh, where he thought we would be safe, anticipating an attack on Manila and Cavite. That very same day that we left uh, Baguio, the first attacks, air attacks, took place right in the area where we were having our basketball game. I mean, we could have been decimated. My mother had gotten me up and dressed me and fed me, and uh, she had gone over and had breakfast at the officer's mess and had heard about uh, the, uh, the bombing of Pearl Harbor. But nobody thought Camp John Hay was in any imminent danger, so she took me out for a walk in my stroller. His voice boomed out from the back of the church. Camp John Hay's been bombed. Pearl Harbor's been bombed. A uh, woman lost her leg. 
and she heard the, the Japanese planes coming uh, at about 8.15 in the morning, grabbed me uh, and tried to run for cover and didn't make it. And so she um, suffered a, a, a really major injury. Uh, her right leg had to be amputated on an emergency basis. Uh, I was very lucky. I had uh, one piece of shrapnel that hit me in the left knee. On the morning of December 8th, we sailed into Hong Kong Harbor and we saw all these ships leaving Hong Kong. It was like a, just a steady stream of ships, one right after the other. And my mother went to the office, the uh, branch office, and what she was trying to do was find a ship out of Hong Kong to go to Australia or New Zealand. She was not successful. However, she would kept our berths on the uh, little coastal collier, and the captain had been told to go to the nearest friendly port. And uh, so we got back on that ship. It was the last ship to leave Hong Kong. The outbreak of war was instantaneous. I forget ex the exact hour, but in the wee hours of our December 8th, uh, we were bombed. And from then on, uh, we were at war, and there was like total mobilization. Army trucks everywhere, blackouts, uh, air raid sirens. Uh, it just happened fast. And suddenly, the world changed. Suddenly, this wasn't the same city, the same place, the same us anymore. There was great things afoot. At that time, we realized that we were in the middle of an air raid. We could see uh, the bombing going on in Cavite. And then they started to hit the ships. And the ship right ahead of us uh, was bombed. As we passed it, it went dead in the water. And as we passed it, it was burning. My father traveled extensively. At that time of the war, he was at Pearl Harbor on a ship that was going to the Philippines. When the captain of the ship realized that it was war, he had to head to the first ports. So he headed for Australia. So he had no idea what had happened to my mother or I. The whole port area and the, it was just, people were frantic. We um, were in such a situation because the streets were starting to flood with people. My dad was killed in the bombing of Manila on the 24th. He uh, needed a new pressure pump for a printing press that they wanted to have available out on Corregidor. And the only place that he had heard you could get one maybe was from the office of the Bureau of Printing and Engraving, which was down in the port area. And nobody particularly wanted to go down there because that was definitely targeted. But he went down and was in the entranceway to the Bureau of Printing and Engraving when he got hit. And Mother and I, he always called after an air raid and he didn't call that day. And so later on in the day, why one of our neighbors came and told us that he had gone. And those Japanese came every day, we knew it. At 12 o'clock, they never changed their time. We would go down to the basement and we had this Spanish style home and the walls were very, very thick. so. A bullet couldn't penetrate, and that was our shelter. We'd go downstairs at 11.30, and 12 o'clock they were there, and they would be gone within the hour. And the, and the next day, they came again the same time. The first flights of our P-40 fighters uh, 
flew over from Nichols Field going north to Clark Field. And of course, those poor guys, many of them were obliterated. I mean, they just wonderful young men who have been brought over uh, to, to hold the line. They had problems with those planes, and they certainly could not compete with the Japanese Zero fighters. What happened then is on the 12th of December of 1941, uh, Hitler declared war against the United States. And since we were German nationals, we were considered to be uh, enemy aliens. So uh, my father prepared a little bag. In fact, we all did because uh, we knew that we were going to be uh, uh, interned just like the Japanese. When the war started, key members of the Japanese society in Manila, and in Baguio, and in Davao were interned by the Americans as hostile enemy aliens. So it was only the men that were taken away. and. Uh, we didn't know where my father was for the next three days, and uh, they were all in Montilupa. Uh, there were 71 in all Germans, a handful of uh, Italians, and about uh, 300 Japanese uh, civilians. MacArthur, at that point, declared Manila an open city. The Manila was being abandoned by the United States forces, that they were going to go into Bataan for a last-ditch last stand. According to an old, old plan called Plan Orange that the American military had set up at, at the beginning of the century, actually. That's how old that Plan Orange was, with Corregidor being the fortress that was going to guard the entrance to the bay and, of course, Bataan, because they were only just miles away by water. What was the thinking behind declaring Manila an open city? We were surrounded. For last night, Radio Tokyo announced that their planes had a perfect right to attack shipping of all kinds, regardless of whether or not they considered Manila an open city. First thing that we began to suspect that all was very bad when the Navy blew up the uh, ammunition at Kaviti. Uh, that was about the middle of the night, and there was this huge explosion. The Kaviti burned bright as day. You could read a newspaper in Manila by the brilliance of that fire over Kaviti. And then there were, I can remember this sinister sense of foreboding. We were told there were fires burning at Nichols Field, and there had been no air. So the Americans were burning things. And I can still uh, remember looking out the window and seeing the little drops of hot oil falling, and the whole sky was red, you know. Uh, the High Commissioner's office, uh, and I think my father was in on that too, the Civilian Emergency Administration, decided that American families should move into the leading hotels and be there, and the Japanese should be notified so that they wouldn't bomb those hotels. So we were moved into a hotel, which is still there, called the Bayview Hotel. The U.S. Army started rounding up the um, Americans, American businessmen who were in bivouac at the Bayview Hotel, asking them if they could take uh, ammunition and uh, medicine to the Bataan Peninsula for their troops. We'd go live in our regular home, which is up in uh, Muson, up in Bulacan Province. And that's where my father lived because that's he was a, he was the what you'd call an engineer in charge of the RCA communications facility. When the Japanese started appearing close to to, a, to our radio station, the army started putting showed up one day. The army engineers and they put in some uh, what do you call it a uh, demolition charges. They were going to destroy the station. The officer in charge of this little detail suggested to my father that he get us out of there very quickly because while they were setting these explosives up another team was ready was mining a bridge between us and Manila and if we did get out by 2 30 because that's when they were going to blow the bridge up we would be trapped. I was so sure that the Americans were going to beat the Japanese within a week and that there was no way that they were going to stay there forever. We were, we were confident we were not going to lose that war. Yeah. Yeah. When the war started, people thought this war will be over because something that's made in Japan is not going to last long. 
the airplanes can't fly. The, the ships, you can probably punch a hole in, your, in one of those ships. The tanks, there were tanks being sold made in Japan before the war and you know, they fell down and they broke. Of course, it was not that way. was uh, in turmoil. Uh, there was no discipline. All law and order had broken down. They opened the ports, and anybody could go there and just get what they wanted. There was a lot of looting at the, during the last there. Uh, Manila was just a while of looting. But it was understandable. The Filipinos were uh, determined to uh, get as much loot as they could to survive. Some of the stores were looted, some of the Japanese stores were looted, especially when the Japanese were interned. So people took advantage and looted these places, which is why some of those Japanese who had friends before the war now had a grudge. We all expected the war, and so the, um, in our family anyway, Dad had bought extra cases of food and all, and during those few days after the Japanese came in, they buried everything they could possibly find uh, in the way of food in the, in the yard and uh, they drank as much of the liquor as was <laughs> reasonable, but they poured that down the drain. Dad had all these uh, uh, cracked wheat and other supplies, which he managed to get off uh, uh, ships which were bound for Burma. And uh, uh, he had the, uh, he diverted the uh, cracked wheat and other food supplies into these warehouses and had them locked up. Japanese never knew about that and they were able to get those supplies into uh, Santa Tomas camp later. For six months, you see, that really saved our lives because the Japanese did not give us anything. They were so involved with the fighting. What was Christmas Day like for you then? We didn't have it Christmas that year. We ate turkey and lumpia, and we were happy to be alive. And so then the big retreat occurred. We, we spent a very sad Christmas. Very sad Christmas. The next day, we were at the Bayview Hotel before Christmas and then went to the Manila, Manila Hotel because they had a proper um, air raid shelter there. It was, it was interesting, some of the old the deb debutantes, you know, they wouldn't dare show up, you know, without their makeup and their hair and done up properly. We had sandbags to prevent uh, shrapnel from coming into the main lobby, planted in the front room. Nothing to do but sit around and kind of play cards and wait, anticipation. I remember our head accountant, Manila, Karim Rizzuti, was sitting at a, we were playing poker, and uh, he looked up from his hand, he said, they're here. It was January 2nd, we could hear this roar in the distance. Just thousands of Japanese soldiers. The year was 1935. The Philippines had been under American dominance since the Spanish-American War in 1898. There were about 7,000 Americans living in Manila, Many had been born there and considered Manila to be the only home they ever knew. Known as the Pearl of the Orient, Manila reflected the modern convenience of American influence as well as the beauty of the old Spanish culture. For the Americans, life in Manila was easy, languid, and privileged. Before World War II, Manila was a very cosmopolitan city. So in fact, it had been cosmopolitan for a hundred years or more. We were more Americanized than we knew. By and large, I think the different, all the peoples in Manila coexisted. They lived together and they were used to accepting foreign cultures as long as the foreign cultures did not dominate them. Well, the 40 years of uh, American occupation in the Philippines did a lot to make the Filipinos love the Americans. 
before the Commonwealth, 1935. 1935, they had a police force and my father was the chief of police then and they were in Masic where uh, Luneta is now. When they established the Commonwealth, then they did away with, they put the Filipinos already in charge. Um, my grandfather was in the sugar business in Hawaii for many years. And uh, he was wooed by a big corporation in San Francisco to be a partner and go out to the Philippines. He was there and running the plantation, and we were all born on the plantation. We had a lot of friends come on weekends because my grandfather, we had a big uh, golf course, swimming pool, tennis court, riding stables, which he duplicated for the Filipino laborers as well. So there were 3,000 laborers on the plantation. So whatever he built for us, he built for them. And we went to the American school where again, uh, we had just a, a, a global family from everywhere. At the time, Filipinos were not admitted to the school. Later, I was happy to see after the war that it really became an international school. easy living because we all had lots of servants you know the chauffeur would take us to school and we had you know the cook and we had the lavandero who did the laundry and the houseboy and whatnot it was easy living we were all spoiled rotten because of that and my father progressed real well with his business and then he opened up the, the plaza lunch and it was the most popular area for Americans to come. And my father devoted his whole life at, practically at the restaurant. We hardly ever saw him at home. I was on the Philippine Islands working for Pan American Airways, Pacific Alaska Division. We had a, a main office at the Manila Hotel, the office which handled passenger traffic and express. In other words, you bought your ticket to get on an airplane through our office. It was a very glamorous, interesting kind of environment to, uh, for a young man to find himself in. The clubs, the nightlife, and so forth. There was a slight shortage of young, unattached, eligible girls at that time because there was a large influx of U.S. Army troops and so forth and officers who uh, were competing for the few attractive girls that uh, were around, so. Life in general was just very wonderful. It was comfortable. We had a lot of advantages and adventures. The women then, they had a pretty good life. They stayed home from time to time, but mostly they were out bridge parties and, and tea parties and mahjong parties and that kind of thing or shopping down on the escort. My mother and father, Faye Cook Bailey and Althea Paul Bailey, dad was a assistant manager and had been the credit manager for the bank for a number of years. I was born in the Philippines. My dad had, he'd been with the National City Bank since 1919 so we lived in Manila and in Cebu but um, Manila, the Philippines was my home. <laughs> Half a world away from Europe's new battlefronts of 1940 is the capital of a warrior nation whose 100 million people are in the fourth year of their costly and destructive war, which long ago was to have conquered China and made Japan the master of the Orient. Today, as Europe's war engulfs and weakens more nations, the little men who command the world's third largest navy See in the South Pacific the richest of all colonial prizes, the Netherlands Indies. But between Japan and the Dutch East Indies, they see a potential barrier, the Philippines, a group of 7,091 Pacific Islands which, still under the protection of the U.S. flag, constitute the only major hazard to Japanese plans for new conquest in the war year of 1940.
Well, it was a constant con conversation, and it was um, a, a lifelong anger that my father felt for the State Department for leaving us there uh, in, in the way of, of great harm, and he, he never did forgive the State Department for that. My first husband was a mining engineer, and we lived in Suyok, which was gold mining. Bob was afraid that we really should go home. He said he was not going, but he thought that I should go with David. I flew down to Manila, and I went to the high commissioners, and they said, stay by all means. Wait a minute. The safest place in the, the Orient. The safest place in the Orient. This mm. is it. Is Manila. Is Manila. One thing the, the uh, High Commissioner, who was Francis B. Sayer, his hands were tied. Cordell Hull, the Secretary of State, and this is kind of the feeling in, back in Washington. We don't want to um, really give the Filipinos the signal that we're pulling our people out. Well, of course, it was obvious to us that something was in the wind because uh, all of the military dependents were being shipped home. They were sent home um, on the President Coolidge, a lot of them, and in April of 1941, and the word was out, get out if you can, because we're not entirely safe here. And my stepdad wanted us to go to Switzerland to be safe. And my mother wouldn't hear of it. Her whole Spanish family was there. She said, this is home, I'm not going anywhere. My father's company in New York asked him to get me and my mother and my brother out of the Philippines immediately. My mother got Pan American tickets to fly us out, something like December the 5th. My mother, of course, didn't want to leave my father, so she went to the U.S. Embassy and said, I have tickets because my husband's company is advised that we leave due to the, the Japanese hostilities in China. They might be coming down to the Philippines. Don't worry, no way would the Japanese ever take the Philippines. Corregidor is impregnable. MacArthur would never let that happen. We were a cocky bunch. The Americans were. A lot of Japanese businessmen in Manila. Uh, they were apprised of a lot of the stuff that was going on militarily. They had spies. It was no accident. They knew they were coming. Oh, yes, I know. He went to the high commissioner's office and, and asked, and he was told, not a problem, don't worry about it. We're, we're, we're going to be able to defend the Philippines. But shortly before the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, he also went to a meeting with all the high uh, officials, including uh, the top military brass, and every single person who spoke at that meeting uh, said that the Japanese are going to attack and uh, we're going to be overwhelmed. But it was too late to get out by that time. Well, we were what, lame ducks? And they, there, was, there were hundreds of them that came in on bicycles. And these were not crack troops. These weren't fresh crack troops. They had come from Manchuria and China and, and all over the place. They were on bicycles, lots of them bicycled. There was nobody on the streets, you know, and we were inside the house, but we were peeping through the shutters and we saw them march in down the street, a whole group of them. High Commissioner's office had the presence of mind to uh, <clears throat> notify the Japanese of a selection site for uh, our internment. 
and that selection site uh, was Santa Tomas University, a Spanish, at one time a Spanish university. And when we were in the Philippines, it was the oldest uh, university under the American flag. 3,000 of us were to be put in that, uh, in that building. Before the war, uh, the different neighborhoods were organized so that they were listed by the Red Cross as to who was in which neighborhood. When the Japanese came in, all they had to do was refer to those lists and bring us in. They knew just where we lived, and so that's how it was so efficiently done. We drove down Dewey Boulevard and saw the Japanese flag flying at the High Commissioner's office. And that hurt. That was, in fact, a lot of that began to seep in. This arrogance, you know, the assuredness of the Japanese. That they were unbeatable. Conquerors of everything. Americans and such and such nationalities are to report with uh, clothing and food to last three days, three days mm -hmm. you know, which. That didn't That's sound quite right, but it was a it was a misleading thing designed to lull you, I guess. I don't think they knew what the hell to do with us anyway. When the Japanese soldiers landed here, uh, almost all the Japanese soldiers who were involved in the invasion of Southeast Asia were given little booklets and they were told why they were invading these countries. And the, one of the main points there was that you're liberating these people. They have been under Western domination for hundreds of years, and now you are liberators. So, so many of the soldiers expected to be received as liberators, except that when they landed in the Philippines, they were met by guns and, and artillery, and they couldn't quite understand this. So they said, we are liberating you people, but you're fighting us. So they really didn't understand the, the state of mind that the Filipinos had. I think it was the night of January 2nd, a couple of drunken Japanese soldiers came to the house. Um, there was shooting in the neighborhood, there were honking of horns, uh, et cetera. And then finally, my dad ordered the houseboy to open the gates. Oh, everybody was, um, was uh, scared, afraid. They didn't, we didn't know what was going to happen to us, what they were going to do. The, the one Jap had uh, his gun right at my father's chest. What did you think they might do to you? Oh, they, we thought that they would kill us all. They were demanding all kinds of things, liquor, watches, cameras, keys to the car. That's why we all, you know, wanted to be together. So in case they, you know, they're, they're gonna harm us or whatever, then we'd all, at least we'd all be together and they told us at the time to pack food and clothing for three days and that he would be by the next day to pick us up. They went from house to house looking for the Americans. And they came into the house, everybody was telling my dad, don't, don't give yourself up, you know, just hide. And they won't, they'll never find out, nobody will tell. But my father said, no, 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 that's, that's, not, that's not right. I, I don't want to be hiding all this time. I'll go. Well, sir, we have to take you to the concentration camp. When we heard concentration camp, we started to cry. You know, all those thoughts of what they were doing in Germany and all that. And, uh, of course, we gave him food. We, we all started to cry. And we told the Japanese, we'll go too. My mom, Charito, and I. We're a family, why don't you take us all to the camp so we can all be together? Oh no, no, we're just taking Americans. You're not considered Americans, you know, because my mother was Filipino. And they took him. By the 30th, they had taken the Dutch East Indies. So on the 30th is when the, the loudspeakers came through and said, all the Dutch have to report. And my mother at the time, and my dad thought that maybe we could stay my mother and my sister and I, because we could just hide our Dutch passports and pretend that we were locals, because Spanish, because, um, because we were born there. But my mother said, no, we better stick together. So we all went into Santa Tomas. You're part Spanish then? Uh, I am a quarter Spanish. You could have conceivably passed for Spanish at that time and maybe avoided going to camp? 
Well, I think my, my mother and a couple of us younger kids could have stayed out for a while, but we, I think it was better for us all to be together. At what point did you start to build your bomb shelter? Um, I would say within the, the next two weeks after the first bombing, because it seemed very important to have a place to go. Uh, and this was one of the wisest things we did. We um, grew camote or, or sweet potato plants, which have beautiful thick green leaves. I don't remember if we ever had a crop of sweet potatoes, but anyway, the whole shelter was covered, so it was essentially camouflaged. This is where my mother sat during the, the Battle of Manila four years later, three years later. In your estimation, really, that shelter saved your lives. That shelter... There's no way you would have survived it. Uh, I think that you're right, yes. When the drafts came in, they had some officers come in to take over the baby hotel, talk to the owners, and they were telling them, tomorrow we're coming, we're bringing, we want to interview everybody, but everybody has to stay in because we're going to send you to a prison camp. When they came to our room, my whole family was in there. There were four of them, four officers, and they had the white crisp collars, you know, and the sabers and the shiny, shiny boots. Well, they saw me walk from the bathroom to the middle of the floor. Then they were all seemed fascinated with my braces. They must have had polio in, in Japan too, but they didn't have. But know, they this they did recognize it as polio. Ah, uh, no. They wanted to know what that all this stuff was, and so my mother said infantile paralysis, and so they had to get up and walk and walk back and forth and then they're you know talking among themselves we were told also i remember this very vividly that we, we, we would now be under the benevolent custody of the japanese they told my mother that we were americans and we were going to be prisoners of war and that everything that was in the house belonged to them uh, my older brother uh, had a quail that he caught, he caught in, a, in a little cage. So he, he asked me, Frank says, uh, how about coming out with me early in the morning? We'll sneak out and we'll check our, my lines and traps here. So I says, okay, but Dad'll get angry. Oh, don't worry, we'll sneak out early. And we went up, looking up his trap line about a hundred yards from the house, the hut rather. And we were so busy putting some trapped quail into his new his carrying cage that we didn't notice him coming. It was the Japanese soldiers. They had us in sight, you know. We saw them and we decided, you know, it was time to get going. Or we hid in the grass for a while, you know, the brush. And that's when I heard this voice call out real loudly, just stand where you are, boys, in perfect English. And they sort of surrounded we, my brother and I. And uh, that's when the Japanese officer, he said, boys, says, you're under arrest. And says, you're my prisoners, and you are prisoners of war. And that's why I looked at him. I says, I can't be a prisoner. I'm only nine years old. Well, during the Spanish-American War, I think there must have been a number of African-Americans who, who wanted adventure and thought the Philippines was the place to go. My father uh, is from McKinney, Texas, and he's from a city that was named after his father. And one day, we thought everything was going to be safe because my mother's Filipino, everybody knew she was Filipino. One day, some Filipinos pointed us out to the Japanese. The Japanese was, were just making a, a, just a, a walk through the neighborhood and they, point, they pointed them out and said, that's McKinney, that's McKinney. And so the Japanese came and asked us, you know, what nationality are you? And we had, we had to say we were American. So all of us were bundled together. My mother was left out and we were taken to Santo Tomas. In the meantime, my mother was well prepared and she had everything in bundles, of clothing and all everything that she could think of putting aside. And then she took all her jewelry and stuffed it into a pillow. They would come every day to investigate if we were at home. But these two Japanese soldier, uh, lieutenants 
came upstairs and they didn't say but a few words from the interpreter and they said that we were being taken to a prison camp. We didn't know what camp they were talking about. So my mother got her pillow with the jewelry and she brought a bag of clothing and I bought a bag of clothing and we followed them downstairs and there was a, a truck and there were a few American men in their truck already and they got us up to be in the back and we sat in the truck and that was the last time I saw the loyal houseboy in our home because our home was bombed during the occupation and they took us to camp and that's where we stayed for three years and one month. We didn't know where we were going, what we were doing. But the Japanese <clears throat> um, soldiers finally gave us the instructions. And it, well, it was a Japanese officer, actually, who, and he did this, as I recall, in English. And they were Kempai Tai. These are the their special police, you know, who gave us instructions. The men were to go to one floor, the women to the next. No men and women on the same floor. There was complete chaos by the time we got up to that second floor. We were given a room. I still remember the room number, room 35. And we were put in that room, <clears throat> and it was, there was just too many of us for the room. Soon after, soon, maybe two weeks, that we were getting organized, and uh, they wanted women and children in the annex. That was a crying, crying, sick, vomiting mess for two months at least. It was awful. There were, um, all our cots were put together. I mean, there was no space. Sometimes you had five cots in a row jammed together, and then you had a little uh, aisle way to walk in, but then you had kids that were sick, and then you had kids with dysentery, and then the kids with dysentery were taken out. I had a uh, uh, a recurring nightmare uh, that was really the only uh, indication I had or have that I, at some level as a child, knew something was 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 terribly wrong. Uh, in my bed, I could look out into the hallway. And in my dream, I would see a Japanese soldier coming up the stairs on a blue horse to get me. And I would wake screaming, and, and my mother couldn't calm me down because I couldn't tell the difference between being in the dream and being awake. And that happened over and over again in the camp. Exactly uh, what you packed on that day? No, I don't remember. I do remember that I had to leave my bear behind. <laughs> And he didn't come into camp until a few months later. <laughs> You'll see pictures of the bear, I think. Tell me about your bear. Well, as I recall, we had seen a movie, I think, with Shirley Temple about two years before. And she had this big white teddy bear. And I decided I wanted a big white teddy bear. So my dad ordered this bear from the White House in San Francisco. And I received it, I think, on my seventh birthday. And so uh, he's, he's been my pal. <laughs> Just a minute ago, as you started talking about the bear, I noticed that you were getting a little teary-eyed. What, what emotion does that bear evoke for you? I don't know, it's a funny thing. Um, I feel like I put this all behind, and yet, I haven't. Now, your mother was also an American, where she oh, yes. Spanish or yeah, no? She was she was part Chinese and part British. She was a Eurasian. When I got there, I saw all these different people, you know, from all walks of life in the camp. There, some were British, some were different nationalities, 
and um, we didn't know where we were going to be billeted at. We had no idea. My sister Ethel was with my mother and Mary Lou. And they had British women in that room, some from Hong Kong. Their ship got caught there. And some of the British, believe it or not, they were very, very, uh, I would say prejudiced maybe in a way because uh, they right away they told my, told my mother that Hoff and Hoffs are not allowed here. Well, life in camp was basically getting up at six in the morning, and we were staying in classrooms that were converted into dormitories, and we had only 28 inches of space. And that 28 inches of space was like gold, because your neighbor next door, if you moved an inch too much, she was right at your back. The system was that, um, it, well, first, the first six months, the Japanese made no, no effort whatsoever to do anything for the camp. They just plunked us there. So the Red Cross immediately went to work and uh, they uh, commandeered, or they had supplies in Manila of beds and uh, uh, various warehouses had foods. Many of those though were, were looted and taken over by the Japanese. But they took on the, the feeding of the camp and rounded up medical supplies. And that's an amazing story and I'm sure you've had it from others you've interviewed the way that camp pulled together with some of its best talent and right very soon they organized an executive committee the interaction with the with the commandant or, or the japanese was always done through the committee from the very beginning the americans seemed to have this instinct of organization <laughs> and errol carroll was one of the first people that got taken into camp. He was with uh, an insurance company, and uh, but he was a good organizer, and so he kind of took charge. And then, of course, they immediately set up all these committees. Uh, Grinnell's name was on the list, and he got designated to be the chief executive officer for the camp. And then there was a sanitation committee, there was an education committee, there was every room in camp had a monitor, and the monitors had an overall monitor so there was a structure there of passing down rules and all that and so the whole camp was really very well organized from the very start. There were very few toilet facilities for this number of people that were con concentrated in this main building. There were, it put 4,000 people in a three-story building with toilet facilities, uh, 12, 12 um, per four, 24 showers and commodes and the limit, you, you couldn't go to your local supermarket and get a 12-pack a, a roll of, uh, whenever you needed it. You had to make what you got last as long as you could. So the, there was a, a detail called the issue tissue detail. <laughs> that coupled with the fact that you had a complete, total destruction of your normal diet, everybody developing gastroenteritis and diarrhea and uh, it, it, things were kind of messy for a while. The, one of the jobs that all the teenagers had to have was the washing of menstrual rags. You know, we didn't have tampons or whatever else, so we had to wash them and it was the most dreaded duty, but we had to do it. And then finally, after a while, you didn't need it because when, you, when you're ill-fed and, and, and in, in stress, your, your, your period dries up, so then that was over, that part was over. Well, we, we, were, we were losing our shame because we had to shower together. We had to dress together. There was no privacy. But the first you know, year or so, it was very hard to share a shower. And then you had to hang on to your soap if you were lucky to have it because somebody would steal it. The same way with a toothbrush. And then we used salt instead of toothpaste because we didn't have any. It was, you know, living was hard. I recall the fact that it was crowded and it was crying and people screaming and lots of things happening. And I recall the difficult times if you had to go to the bathroom 
and uh, because there was a long lineup all the time and a lot of times I was just we were just kids we didn't make it to the bathroom I was treated by the a couple of times in the camp hospital for acute uh, well I had impetigo and hepatitis and gastroenteritis and dengue fever all within a year and uh, <laughs> the uh, the girls got me for my 22nd birthday, the finest present I'd ever received before or since. A bottle of paragoric and a roll of tissue. <laughs> Bless their souls. <laughs> Schooling was remarkably good for the circumstances there. We didn't have as many books as we should. We certainly didn't have the writing materials we needed. How long did it take for them to organize school? I think it was within a month, uh, because all our teachers moved into camp with us. We didn't have many books, though. I remember already, you know, in fourth grade, having to go to a library to look up the books. <laughs> there was a small building on top of the roof, and that's where the classes were held. And I think um, it seemed like there was about 20 kids in my class. We had some wonderful teachers in camp. I, mean, I had a wonderful science teacher, I think, who was actually the high school science teacher. We had all the teachers from the American School, many from Bordner, and then there were college professors from UP. We had to take notes in those days, because, you know, and. Uh, at that point, initially, we had pens and pencils and all. We couldn't have any uh, maps. We're not allowed any maps. We couldn't have any history beyond 1900. Geography was sort of out of the question. Oh, totally out of the question. <laughs> and we had actually very good school. I think very few of us actually lost out on schooling. There were kids graduated from high school. Well, we were all excited because we were going to have a graduation. And everybody who had any white dresses, please let them, let the, uh, the girls wear them you know, borrow them. And the boys were to wear white, too. And uh, afterwards, I don't know how we managed it, but we had ice cream and cake. Were the Japanese there at the ceremony? I don't recall them being there. How many of you graduated? I think about 30 of us, yeah. Well, we had a lot of entertainers in camp. And that entertainment was a, was a break in our monotony and it gave us something to look forward to because a lot of us were performers. We had a lot of shows, stage shows put on by Dave Harvey. I think you've heard of Dave Harvey. And, uh, and he had the two ladies who were sisters, Phyllis and Eva Dyer, who were with him on his enterprise. And we put on a lot of these wonderful stage shows. Some of them were... Um, quiz shows and you won a jar of peanut butter or something like that. And I was, I was once on one of the uh, quiz shows and it had to do with authors. And I won the prize. I named the greatest number of authors. And it lasted about an hour and I was so, so proud of myself. But the main thing is that I had won a pound of sugar as first prize. And I'll never forget that because it was so rewarding to, win, to have sugar available. We made footlights out of cans, you know, for shades or whatever you want to call them. And uh, it was fun to do that. And it, it really was a break from monotony. Everybody got to forget everything. Fortunately, the Japanese allowed us to make contact with the Filipinos, our servants and friends on the outside. And how did they go about doing that? And this was, it must have been utterly chaotic, but I, they would be at the gate, the, the front gate of the Santa Tomas had iron bars rather than a cement wall. And so all the Filipinos, friends and all were on the outside waving and carrying stuff and, and the Americans were on the inside <laughs> grabbing up to the wall and exchanging and they immediately decided we had to organize this. So that was the beginnings of the package line. The package line was open certain hours, certain days. You could go up to the main gate area and see if you had a friend, a relative, servant, or whoever bringing you something. And this was a saving grace for many of us because 
we, we uh, got our noonday meal this way throughout a good year and a half, I think, of, of our internment. But we were lucky because there were a lot of people who didn't have these Philippine contacts. There were people who were um, just stranded in the Philippines. I vaguely remember the time when I did go out in front at the time packages came. I guess I was, uh, maybe I was a little jealous, but I didn't want to be that. They had it and I didn't, and I, there was no way I was going to get it. 95% uh, of, of my friends w were interned. Because my mom was Spanish, with, with Swiss citizenship, due to her marriage to my stepfather, and we were all minor children, um, we just stayed at the house. They slapped red armbands on us and gave us passes. Uh, and essentially, we were essentially under house arrest. We were told we should only go out to shop uh, when necessary, and then we could be stopped anywhere at any time by Japanese sentries. When we came into camp, there was uh, guards with the, you know, the little short men with the, the rifles and bayonets that were above their heads, it's very high, and uh, I could go up and, and talk with them, and, th and they liked kids, and they would uh, pat us on the head. But that whole thing, that whole attitude changed just fairly shortly because a uh, couple of months, two or three months after we were in there, three men escaped over the wall at night. And they were captured the next day. We could hear them screaming when they brought them back into camp. They tortured them first, you know. Well, they were tortured down on the first floor, and then they were taken out on the, in the open area there. And then they were whisked away, and they were forced to dig uh, their own graves. We no longer thought of the uh, Japanese as being friendly or anything. We just completely stayed away from them. We would have nothing to do with them. The Japanese already had come into Manila, in Bataan and Corredor, where they were still fighting. Every night, you know, from our place in San Juan, San Juan is a mountain. From our place, from the second floor of our house, as you look into Manila Bay, at night, you could see, you could see the flashes. flashes of artillery. You know, the... the you could hear. All, yeah, you could hear. And, and only, it came only from the Japanese side. Then the playground, bless America, it just makes me cry up to now. And that I love, we love that song. And then they sing Mabuhay. And then the guy, let's pray for the boys. They're holding up. We're still fighting here. We're waiting for help. put a stop to further useless sacrifice of human life on the fortified island. Yesterday, I tendered to Lieutenant General Connolly, the Commander-in-Chief of the Imperial Japanese Forces in the Philippines, the surrender of the four harbor defense forts of Manila Bay. Was there a, a sort of a final acceptance when Bataan fell? Mm. For as long as uh, Bataan and Corregidor stood, most Filipinos felt all right. The, the war was proceeding a little more slowly than they expected. But once Bataan and Corregidor fell, 
that meant that the Americans were not coming back. The reinforcements had not arrived on time. Did, was there a general feeling like the Americans had let you down, had let the Philippines down? Correct. And uh, there was uh, a, a feeling, but deep in our hearts, uh, most of us, because a lot of us were also involved in the resistance movement, there was a lot of clandestine radios, and I had one of those, and we would listen to broadcasts about the Americans uh, coming back. And so uh, a number of Filipinos in the cities particularly decided to try to accept things as they were and try to make the best out of conditions without necessarily committing to the Japanese. With the fall of Bataan and Corregidor, uh, that was a very, very sobering event for us and uh, for the Philippines as a whole. Uh, because it clearly meant that there would be no quick change in the situation. We were there for the long haul. Everybody had a, a camp chore. My mother was a vegetable peeler, and I was a disher-upper, the big cauldrons, dishing up the food. We had a camp garden, and there was a shed, an eating shed, where the women would go and prepare the vegetables for the central kitchen to utilize. And uh, then another thing, too, was initially to prepare all this food, uh, they, they had a, a crew of women uh, going over the rice and picking out the worms and, uh, and the nuts and all oh, those stones and things like that. But then later on, then they used to have uh, weevils in the camotes because they were there for so long. It's not fresh. And pretty soon you didn't need the women to take the weevils out because the weevils were a source of protein. And people ate them gladly. What were your jobs? Mine, uh, well, was putting food on the food line. Most of the time was spent uh, carrying the pots of food from the kitchen to the chow line. We had two chow lines there and, and and mostly uh, women did the serving. But it was always nice if you knew somebody who worked in the, in the kitchen. Like one of my boyfriends worked in the kitchen and he was able to scrape what was left over of the rice, the cauldrons of rice, you know, burnt rice. You scrape it off. And it's, you know, he'd sneak some to me every once in a while. But I'll tell you what is the most amazing thing is uh, they knew how much food there was Boy, they hardly ever had anything left. In the early days, you could buy food. I mean, the, these people that you're talking about who were able to get the packages, often they would be entrepreneurs. They would set up a little stand and sell eggs or uh, even cooked foods. Like I remember for my birthday, my mother let me go to one of these stands and buy a fried egg. Uh, so people who ha the haves were able to uh, sell, and make little businesses. And then as uh, the time went on, and even they began to uh, get less and less because the people in Manila were, were also uh, being restricted on what they could obtain in the way of food stuff, then a black market uh, developed. And if you had money, you could buy things on the uh, black market that you could not otherwise get. So we would write IOUs. And I got a pound of rice, a pound of sugar, a pound of beans. And we had to, I had to sign a note to this gentleman. I'll call him that loosely. He was a black mar market. And we were so hungry that I figured I'd just write him a note for whatever it costs. It was $2,500. And when I got home to my father, I wasn't home a week. There was a letter from the, this man asking for his money. And my father asked me if it was true. I said, yes. I said, but you don't have to pay him. He says, no, you're safe. It saved your life. I have to pay him. And he wrote out a check for $2,500. Early on, Calhoun and a couple of the other bachelors in the National City Bank um, ha had a shanty built for them. Uh, the Japanese allowed people to make 
some sort of structure outside to spend the day in. And until we got really crowded, which was probably well over a year, uh, nobody was allowed to sleep in them. But eventually they allowed men to sleep in the shanties. I was so happy when we ended up with this wonderful shanty, even though uh, you know, the shanty you could see through it from all angles and that was required because because there wasn't to be any hanky-panky going on in the camp there. Initially, they were just kind of patched together with cardboard and, and scraps of wood and all. But we were allowed to have our Filipino friends send in lumber. It was the typical Filipino nipa shanty. It had a slat floor of split bamboo and then the walls were made of sawali, which is a palm, um, a palm leaf folded over and, and made like into shingles. And then we had a little um, kind of a, a, a shelf that went, that went out from the main building, in the main shanty, and, and kind of stuck out a little at the side. And that was where we had a charcoal stove, and that's where we uh, were able to cook. For a while, Somebody gave the Japanese a notion that uh, men and women should not have too much contact in camp. The boys shouldn't hold the girls' hands, etc. And if anybody got pregnant, why that was the ultimate. And so uh, they convinced the commandant to require us to build a jail inside our camp. This was in the early days of Santa Tomas, a jail within a jail. And when women got pregnant, married women got pregnant because somehow or another they arranged it. They put the husbands in jail and they were in jail for some period of time. Finally this wave of Puritanism uh, was overcome and, and, and the jail ended. This day I had finished everything I had to do and my washing my so on and I thought I think I'll go out in front and watch that basketball game. I always liked basketball. I played basketball. Pretty soon a man walked up beside me and he said, what's the score? But I thought he's the handsomest man I ever did see. <laughs> when the game was over we walked back to the uh, to the main building and she says I, I live in the annex. That's the first time inkling I had that she had a y y youngster. We liked each other. So how did you start dating one another? Just by accident. We didn't make times at first. And then we decided I could get away from David and my jobs and so on early in the morning. And so we walked early in the morning. And they yeah. took 800 able-bodied men up to uh, Los Banos to build a, 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 another camp, and I was one of those 800 able-bodied men. We made Jerry Ann the night he left. We know exactly when Jerry Ann was uh, conceived and uh, so forth, uh, and uh, she became a, a, a marked woman because of that. Then life became difficult. Anyway, I knew how people like I were treated and so on, and I knew it would happen to me. Yes, we got when married we after we got out because she didn't know whether her husband was still alive or not. Uh -huh. and. Uh, I didn't know what to, what happened to my wife during the war because uh, a lot of things happened in in three years. My folks were missionaries, and they were missionaries on the island of Panay. And did you have any siblings there as well? I had an eight-year-old brother. I was in the city of Manila and going, just starting high school. 
They were living in the woods, and they built huts back in the jungle. Our group where my parents were, were still not turning themselves in. Somebody uh, somehow or other got wind of where they were, and the news got back to the Japanese, and the Japanese attacked or went and found them. And uh, they were given orders to execute them all. And there were some miners and uh, some other um, missionaries that were included, as well as my brother. And they were, they were beheaded. There were a lot of rules about uh, dress code. I think women weren't allowed to wear shorts, and and there were very strict rules about being in the buildings at a, you know from what six in the morning until eight or so at night. I think the worst thing that we were subjected to that we felt was the roll calls, and I think at first they allowed the monitors to just kind of check and see if there were everybody was there at night. But then they decided that we needed to actually stand in line and be counted. And I can remember more than one occasion where we stood in line for a couple hours. We had to bow when the Japanese guards came around, and they came around pretty frequently at roll call. And we even had lessons on how to bow properly. And they got very annoyed on at least one occasion because they didn't feel that they were, we were bowing in the right way. Filipinos were not used to bowing. Even today, we are not used to bowing. If you did not bow properly, then the Japanese would slap you. In, in the Japanese society at that time, it was, uh, slapping was a very minor form of punishment. But to the Filipinos, that was a very major thing. Because to Filipinos, being hit in the face was something that attacked your whole being. You don't touch someone in the face unless you know that person properly. And what more, being slapped. The Japanese guards would talk to you in a glutteral type of expression. Hurrah! Hurrah! Meaning, hey you! And one of the things that they want is, you know, make you stand attention. It's Kyotsky! Kyotsky! Meaning, they want your arms down to your side, straight up. That's when they knock the living daylights out of you. They like to slap you around. The Commandant wanted to see us, and uh, that we had been selected for this exchange, this repatriation. Then I had countless uh, uh, inquiries from fellow internees who knew me and those who didn't know me. Uh, could I get messages to their folks? My mother applied. She mentioned, you know, that she was widowed and that she was the only one to provide for me and so please would they let her go home, but she was denied. There were a number of people who were on that list that many people questioned. There were some talks that they were selected because they had been very friendly with the Japanese, and the Japanese had worked them in somehow, but that's just, it's just a hearsay. Yeah, there were a lot of questions about it, probably more so now than there were at the time. It was envy. And heck, they were going home. Many people said they didn't want any part of leaving. They felt like, you know, they were bailing out and that it was, we were going to tough it out. The exchange was to take place in the northern Philippines. September 26, 1943, 127 internees were trucked to Lingayan Gulf to board the Teo Maru bound for Goa, where the exchange between Japanese and Allied prisoners took place. The internees transferred to the Griff's home and sailed to New York, arriving just before Christmas, 1943. Then there was an event that occurred in 1943 that, uh, uh, that upset everything, and uh, this was the turning point to the worst. And this was in November of 1943, where Manila was lashed by a tropical disturbance, a typhoon. And Manila, it rained over Manila uh, excessively for about two or three days. This was the worst flood Manila had experienced in 40 years or so. 
and so much of the food resources were destroyed. Combined with a, an extraordinary high tide, the banks of the Classic River overflowed, and the, uh, I'd say that three-fourths of Manila uh, was underwater. We were living in Pasay at the time, and uh, uh, the water in our garden was uh, chest high. By December, you have really serious problems with food. In Manila, we had nothing. We had nothing. The, the Japanese army really was operating on a policy of self-sufficiency. So the Japanese military really uh, was living off the land, so to speak. So even for clothing, uh, basic commodities, food especially, most of that was uh, taken up by the Japanese army. Yes, they confiscated everything. Everything. Economic Affairs Minister Pedro Sabido, representing the Philippine government, accepts the gift of 3,000 sacks of imported polished rice donated by the Imperial Japanese Army and Navy in the Philippines to alleviate the existing food shortage in Manila and Cavite. Following this, the actual delivery of the 3,000 sacks of rice takes place at the Army Rice Bodega. Just look at all this rice being carried out of the bodega. Very soon, perhaps some of this white rice will appear on your dinner table. There was very little food coming in. And at one time, you know, the Philippine government prohibited the entry of any food. It, everything had to be brought into the city by the government agency. And uh, they were unsuccessful in any scheme, you know, that, uh, that they came up with. So finally, they, you know, they, they, they had to recall this. They had to cancel this order so that uh, private persons can, could, bring in any, could bring in food. But any time you brought in a truckload of uh, rice to Manila or anything, poultry, to sell in the markets of Manila, they would just confiscate, confiscate that. It. I can't remember the first Christmas, but the second Christmas is when we got our relief package. You know, the Japanese, the American Red Cross sent one 50-pound package to every internee, civilian as well as military. Once a month. Once a month. For the entire three years. And, and <laughs> we didn't get For them. the entire three years, we got one. And that was at Christmas of 1943. If it hadn't been for that one, I don't think we would have survived. The comfort kits had been given to us. We we'd, were supposed to have gotten quite a few comfort kits, but one kit came through, and we rationed that. Because the food was getting so bad. And then Lynn said to my mother and dad and my sister and myself, he says, I think we should try to make this package of food last for one year. So Lynn and I were eating together, and mother and my sister and my dad were eating together. We would open a can of Spam, divide it into three, and have between the two of us one third on a Monday, and the next other third on a Wednesday, and the next third on a Friday, and we'd open one can a week. It was a, a cardboard box, and it had cereal, carol syrup, uh, butter that military butter that tastes more like cheese, you know, and uh, cigarettes. So we made that last quite a long time, and other people were re tra trading their canned goods for cigarettes, and you know they're the ones that starved yeah. because it's Smart the starvation was terrible. Trade the cigarettes for canned goods. I know it's awful. We used to. Um, uh, like to have a drink before dinner. That was something that my father and mother just couldn't give up. They had to have a drink before dinner. But alcohol was extremely expensive and pretty much impossible to get. And uh, so my father managed to buy a few cloves of garlic now and then. And we would take a glass and he would rub the garlic around the glass and he'd pour water into it, giving it a garlic flavor. And so we would, uh, this, this garlic flavored glass was a Coca-Cola for me and a, uh, uh, a scotch and soda for my father and a Canadian club and ginger ale for my mother. Well, I think the real turning point was, was in that period in uh, February of 1944 when the Japanese shut down all of our contacts to the outside. And also at that time, rather than, than having um, Miss, the, the food being bought by our own buyers, um, the Japanese said we were now under the war, war ministry and they would supply us with food. So they would ship in truckloads of commodities and rice and whatever 
And I noticed in my dad's diary frequently, it mentions that the, the weight that came in was way below what they said it was going to be. And sometimes the food was totally inedible. There are times when the fish was brought in that wouldn't even feed the cats. <laughs> Things really deteriorated very fast. And that was when people really started going downhill because we were really totally at the mercy of the Japanese at that point. January 3, 1945. Coconut milk, weak coffee, and weaker rice mush. Mostly water. Weighed myself this morning. Weighed 119 pounds. When I was in the gym, I held at 170 pounds. And now, the extreme low. Oh well, it won't be long now. When was the last time you saw your father then? We looked for my father, and they told us that they had been evacuated to an evacuation hospital, which was the Quezon Institute. We went to see him, and he was already, he lost, well, Butch must have told me, he lost like 80 pounds. He was skin and bones, you know, lying on a cot with plasma. But, oh my gosh. And he, he cried out to us because we, we would have passed him. We, we didn't recognize him. So we stayed there and, uh, and, and Charito was the one who stayed overnight. We were going to take turns and that night he died. Finally, in 1944, it, it just all hell broke loose. I mean, and, and in, in the city also. The, the situation, the food situation became so acute that uh, in the month of December of 1944, an average of 100 uh, civilians, 100 Manilans, uh, were dying of starvation. In uh, January, about uh, 300 were dying a day. Uh, you couldn't get rice. You, the Japanese were sending all the rice to their, their armed forces. The Filipinos were beginning to starve. Uh, meat was totally unavailable. We were living on rice and mung beans uh, for weeks and short rations of those. We had two cats that I recall. One we called Basura, and then she had kittens, and we had a kitten named Uling. And, um, they both disappeared and, and uh, they were skinned and, and eaten. Help me to understand what it feels like to be truly hungry. It, it just, uh, you craved food. You craved almost anything, but you didn't have it. It wasn't there. Now, when I got hungry, the, when you get so hungry, you have this pain and the pain doesn't go away. And it, it's worse and worse and it spreads out from this nucleus here and it just gnaws. It, it was a, a kind of beaten down attitude you developed. You had no real uh, spark left sometimes. My father, I think, uh, had berry berry. Uh, his legs were practically splitting. He, I, he weighed maybe 89 pounds. My mother the same, and watching them get thinner and thinner. Did you have a sense of the possibility existed that one or both of your parents could have died while you were there in camp with your siblings? Yes, yes. And my father went from 115 pounds, 145 pounds, trim, 5'10", to 115 pounds and then he started getting beriberi, which is where the water leaks into um, your, your pores and you start to look fat and, uh, and even though you're starving to death. Um, so he was very close, I think, to death when we were liberated. My mother was down to 70 pounds. She was practically unconscious, with bacillary dysentery and amoebic dysentery. And she would never give us her, her portion of food. I mean, she would say, I can't eat this, I can't eat this, because she wouldn't dare eat it, because she figured my brother and I needed the nourishment. And I couldn't understand why my father always ate everything of his. He never offered us any food, any of his food. And after the war, I said, Dad, I said, you know, 
mom never would eat. She wanted us to have the food, and you never even offered us a bite. Why? He said, because if anything happened to me, who would take care of you and your brother? I had to stay alive so I could take care of you. Because, you know, my mother was dying at the time. We never expected her to pull through. We worried about my dad. We all worried about my dad. You look at him and you see him so darn thin. He was 175 before the war. He dropped down to 112. So I, mean, I would look at him and see his skinny little ankles and see all the bones in, in his torso. And um, I'd cry. I, I, inside, I, I kept a lot of sadness for that. Uh, there were things going on, but it, it was it was hard to to look beyond the next day. We just simply couldn't. My father got ill, and he dwindled down from a, a robust 165 pounds to uh, I think to about 100 pounds, and they continually said the, 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 that he was sick and, the, and that he couldn't be treated in camp. So they took him out sometime in November. They took him to Bilibid. And, uh, and supposedly there was a hospital in Bilibid. And then on December 14th, which is my birthday, we got word, we, we got word from the Japanese that he had died from malnutrition. Now, there was a complete breakdown of uh, government facilities so that uh, many of these that died uh, in the streets, most of them were in the streets, uh, lay there because uh, the, the government had no facilities, no push carts to pick up uh, these uh, cadavers. So what they did was uh, that uh, they would just cover them with newspapers. Now, <clears throat> a lot of these people, that, a lot of these individuals that uh, were on the verge of starvation and death were um, uh, located around the public markets. Because at the end of the day, what little food they had, uh, spoiled food, vegetables, the market vendors would then throw, and these poor people uh, would fight over this rotten vegetable. And I like to tell the story about realizing why I always used to sing um, this song. Uh, uh, it's raining, it's pouring, the old man is snoring, went to bed and bumped his head and never got up in the morning. Because I realized that it referred to the um, the dead that went past our shanty window uh, as they were reel wheeling them over to the grave area. Yeah, because a lot of the older and you know it was raining at the time, and, and he never got up in the morning. The first American planes to actually bomb Manila would arrive in September 20, 21, 1944. And when the American planes flew over Manila, that was, uh, that was uh, uh, they came in early in the morning and the Japanese were caught completely by surprise. We looked up at the sky and there, there were, we used to see a plane and another plane and another plane and there were literally hundreds of planes. There were probably 300 planes coming over the camp. The Japanese in fact had held an air raid demonstration on that day with three or four of their planes flying in Manila. And when the American planes came in, the Japanese thought they were their own planes, and people thought this was part of the air raid demonstration until the bombs started dropping. Well, we, we were bombed. Uh, all of Manila Bay, all the Japanese ships in Manila Bay were sunk. Central Bank was bombed. There were a lot of casualties, I remember that. Overall, our, our feeling was of such joy to, to see that there was tangible proof, not a rumor which were abounded, but real tangible proof that the Americans were indeed coming. Law and order had just deteriorated, just broken down completely in, in the months of uh, starting already in, in, in October, November, December. December was very bad, and January was. Looting was wide scale. They, 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 the the uh, authorities were helpless. 
you know, to stop it. Uh, warehouses were broken into. Uh, <clears throat> We lived in fear, and then the Japanese had to step in, and uh, they shot some few, a few people to restore order. One day in, in October, I, I was playing with my friends, and the loudspeaker sounded, and that was our uh, contact in the camp between the people. We had been waiting for a rice shipment from Japan, and uh, uh, considering we were starving to death, this was very important to us. So the announcer announced as follows. The announcer said that the ship has arrived in Manila Harbor, and, but it's better late than ever. And we realized the rumors of the Americans landing on Leyte were true. And it just gave the whole camp this, this big lift. And so then we knew that, that the troops were on their way but well, then we expected them to arrive, you know, within a couple of weeks. <laughs> but it wasn't until February. Do you remember your your very last Christmas in 1944? Yeah. Did you spend with your dad? Yeah. Could you recollect that for us? I remember getting a piece of bukayo. What's that? <laughs> That's a coconut uh, candy with brown sugar, rectangular piece. And my dad saying, ah, oh, next Christmas. You know, he would say, next birthday, next Christmas. It seemed like he always kept our hope alive, so we never feared we wouldn't get out of there. Remembering Christmas of 44, that was the most poignant Christmas of all for us. I remember several things. Number one, the bulletin boards had uh, copies of radiograms from International Red Cross wishing us Merry Christmas and all that in the midst of all the grim things that were happening. But I did have a very touching and, and memorable Christmas. I received a couple of the most heartwarming little gifts I'll ever have had in my life. Uh, one friend had, had gotten me a, uh, a little piece of soap which he had traded for a small amount of uh, Nescafe, which enabled us to have that that night. And little Pat Willimont, who was one of the, uh, uh, the food line girls, I remember for some reason had been sweet enough to give me a little wrapped packet for Christmas and she had wrapped a little spoonful of brown sugar and uh, it still brings me to tears. That was quite a Christmas. On December 23, 1944, Carol Grinnell A.F. Duggleby, both members of the Interni Executive Committee, along with Ernest Johnson and Cliff Larson, were arrested by the Japanese authorities. Although no charges were lodged against them, they were held incommunicado for two weeks. On January 5th, they were taken from the camp. No information was provided to the internees as to their destination or their fate. On February 20th, their bodies were found in a vacant lot wired together and apparently beheaded along with the bodies of three American nuns and four Filipino men. No reason was given for their execution, however some surmised that they may have been suspected of aiding and cooperating with Filipino guerrillas. They had paid the ultimate price of being an American who did their duty and tried to help their fellow internees. The tides of war had turned. The mighty Japanese Imperial forces, which had engulfed the Pacific area, were now experiencing huge losses. American forces invaded Luzon on January 9, 1945. Four U.S. Army divisions landed on Lingayan Gulf. General MacArthur waited to shore, fulfilling his promise to return to the Philippines. There had been reliable reports that the Japanese would soon execute all prisoners of war and internees just as they had recently done at Palawan Island. There was an immediate sense of urgency to free the internees at Santo Tomas. At the time of the events of February 1945, I was a captain commanding G Troop 8th Cavalry. The flying column is a uh, well-known military operation which was designed to uh, liberate the uh, internees, civilian internees, 
at Santa Tomas University in the middle of Manila. And the mission was conceived by General MacArthur, who was concerned that these internees might be massacred by the Japanese before they could be uh, released by our forces. They knew of a Japanese order as of August of 44 that the Japanese were supposed to annihilate all prisoners. And when they landed on Palawan, that's what happened. They annihilated, the Japanese annihilated all the military POWs. They dug a trench and made them go into the trench and set it on fire and then machine gun them. So the Americans were very aware that, that POWs were in, at great risk. Uh, we had been chosen, the Marines, to provide the air support for the flying column. The general had met with General Mudge, General Hoffman, and General Trace. He talked to them, and he talked to some of us, and he said, what I want you to do is go, go to Manila, release the prisoners at Santa Tomas. Our orientation was get there, get to Santa Tomas, come hell or high water, break a leg, and anything else is necessary to do that. Uh, we moved out at midnight, actually one minute after midnight on February, January the 31st, which was February the 1st. We had, we had just learned, MacArthur had just learned, in the area were 20,000 Japanese troops scattered throughout. Uh, one thing that worked in our favor was the Japanese troops were scattered. The entire group of some 800 from the 1st Cavalry, 43 tanks with four men in each tank. However, we didn't use them all. We used about uh, 20 of them, I would guess. And we had the seven Marines on the ground with uh, the three uh, brigades of the 1st Cavalry. Altogether, we had a little over a 1,000 troops on the ground. I was the gunner on uh, the battling basic Sherman tank. On that day, we got on the road at around 11 p.m. and we start down the road toward Cabanatuan, the prison camp of the military. Then we went through uh, up to the Angat River and we were stopped cold. And we couldn't get across the river. All of a sudden we were sitting there eating our K rations and one of, I was sitting next to a sergeant of mine and uh, we, all of a sudden on the radios, uh, a voice came on and said, uh, A-24s, call off your strikes, return to base. The A-24, we knew right away was wrong. Ours were SPDs, not A-24. So he made two or three announcements. A-24, call off your strike, return to base. So I grabbed the microphone and I said, guys, don't pay any attention to that son of a bitch. I said, that's a Jap. Don't pay any attention. I said, Jap, you get off the air. I said, just ask him to pronounce the word Honolulu. They can't say it. Say Honolulu. And so there was dead silence, and we never again heard from him, except one of the guys got on the air and was kind of laughing about it. He thought it was funny. About uh, from our bivouac area on the, on the morning of the 3rd, we were informed of a Japanese garrison at the town of Santa Maria. So before dawn, uh, my troop and E troop fixed bayonets and without a sound, without any fire, uh, preparatory fires, uh, we crossed the fields and attacked the Japanese held areas in Santa Maria. Once again, complete surprise. There was not even the, the alarm of a sentry before we broke into their midst and uh, in a flurry of fighting, uh, eliminated. February 3rd was very much uh, very similar to the days that preceded it. Uh, there had been demolitions in the city and there had been fires in the city. And uh, of course, they were very noticeable on February 3rd, but they were not fundamentally really different from uh, what had gone on before. The next morning we hit the hot corner, they called it, because it was a real terrific battle. It was near uh, Novalicious at an intersection, uh, right near the Novalicious, city of Novalicious, and also the Epo Dam, where the water 
a big, huge lake was. We were able to finally scatter them. That's what they would do. They would just finally run in all directions. So we got into this small town after Nogalichus. We discovered that we were running out of gas because we had to wander around the countryside searching for ways of getting over streams. We stopped all of the trucks, got all their spare gas, poured it into the tanks of one platoon who continued to protect us going around and around while we more or less waited for a miracle. Uh, we were sitting around on a little shanty and watching through our little window, or I guess reasonably large window, uh, carrier planes uh, dive bombing and strafing Japanese uh, shipping in Manila Bay, which wasn't too far away. You could see these planes coming through the air and uh, going straight down and you could hear guns going off and every now and then a bomb going off. And we'd been doing this for a, a number of nights. It wasn't anything new. This wasn't the first night. There was nothing uh, particularly notable uh, up until about three or four in the afternoon. And uh, at that time occurred the flyover of the uh, uh, marine dive bombers. Uh, we learned later they were marine dive bombers. But this um, flight of uh, aircraft passed over camp very low, very slow. And of course, it was at that time, which we learned later, that the um, uh, goggles were dropped with the message for the, uh, for the internees. Uh, Roll out the barrel, your Christmas will be tomorrow or Monday. It was like a bee, the bee buzzing. You know how you disturb a hive. Mmm, that whole camp would just hum, 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 hum. You could hear it. After about four hours, three, uh, three trucks of service company came rolling up. They had gas and mail. So we not only filled up with uh, gas, we had letters from home. This is where the great odyssey of the third day started. From the far end of the Novaliches Bridge for the 10 or so miles remaining to Manila, we met Japanese unit after unit, all heading in the opposite direction from us. We we're heading south, they're heading north. They have no idea we are coming. <laughs> and we are coming like wildcats. I was uh, I was playing uh, in um, a, a ways from the main building, and and uh, some uh, other kid ran up to me and said, uh, uh, "There's a Filipino shouting over the fence." And I came, and the Filipino was talking very fast, and and I couldn't understand it, partly because I just couldn't believe it. Um, he kept saying over and over again, "The Americans are coming. The Americans are coming." He must have said it four times before I, I could grasp what he was saying, but I still didn't believe it. In the afternoon of February 3rd, we heard the flying column pass Rizal Avenue. We were on Highway 52, as I recall, and it led us directly to Rizal Boulevard. The problem was that we had to locate Santa Tomas and nobody was particularly sure where it was, even though our maps were pretty good. Excellent, as a matter of fact. We got to the outskirts of Manila. We came into the uh, uh, railroad yards. I can remember that. Somewhere we met this one, I believe it was a colonel, I'm not positive, a Filipino. At that time, we're sitting in the midst of a city absolutely quiet, and apparently devoid of people. Nobody came to look at us even. We sat quietly for about three quarters of an hour, during which F Troop was detached and sent off with a tank platoon to Malacanon Palace. We were joined apparently at that time by two Filipino guides. These were guerrillas who had volunteered to be our guide to 
the Santa Tomas. When this was in place, we moved out. And at that point, my dad was really badly off. He wouldn't have lasted more than a couple more weeks at most. His, his legs were all swollen with beriberi. So he was going to bed at 7 o'clock. And so we were hanging out in the shanty, and our shanty had a pretty good view of the north, so we could see all this going on. And then as it got darker, the huge flares started lighting up the skies. The time for curfew began to approach, and about that time, somebody came by the shanty and said to, to us that uh, people on the fourth floor, third floor, could see tanks and trucks entering the city. And so uh, I told my brother, uh, let's go up to the uh, third floor where we lived on the education building. We were the first two floors of the education building were the Japanese offices and quarters. And the third floor was where the internees uh, lived. So by this time, it was about 8.30. And the ground was shaking. And you could hear the thing, and the flares started. You could see the flares, and you could hear gunfire. And people were saying, oh, Jesus, the Japs are doing this, or, you know, this is what's happening. And people, get out of the, get away from the window. Nobody paid any attention. After a few minutes, the second column arrived. And with that column, I saw Captain Manuel Kulaiko, the head of the Allied Intelligence Bureau in Manila was riding at the back of the weapons carrier. He waved to me and instinctively I ran to him and jumped, joined him. And then as it got dark, um, these fire, huge fires were showing up in the north of Manila and the rumbling noises were getting larger. And there was an announcement came on the PA system. And it was the uh, American missionary interpreter. And he said, Lieutenant Abiko wants to remind the internees that they are not to demonstrate in the face of American airplanes when American airplanes appear. Santa Tomas is still in Japanese hands, he said. And I was astonished at that. When we reached the gate, the front of the gate of Santa Tomas, the gate was closed. This area, the whole, this area was covered by grilled uh, fence with a sawali wall behind. So you, you cannot see through. I tapped Man Nikolaiko, I was behind Man Nikolaiko, and I tapped him on the back. I said, look Mani, the Japanese is just across the fence behind the gate, and I'm sure they're going to shoot at us. We being in civilian clothes, we were both unarmed. I said, let's take over. I moved my people into the column, which was mostly service vehicles at that point, uh, and went forward to uh, find the squadron commander. He was at the gate, uh, the main gate of Santa, of Santa Tomas University, with the squadron exec, Coleco, a council of war was underway, very brief. Ended at the point where a grenade was thrown over the wall by the Japanese guards at the main gate, which wounded Hack Connor, the squadron commander, and mortally wounded Coleco. Captain Coleco was riddled with shrapnels. No, in the mid section, I, the soldiers and I, brought him to the middle of the street. There's an island, grassy island, in the middle of the street, and we laid him there. In the meantime, the top blasted the gate. This was getting on toward dark when we made it to the gates of Santa Tomas. So we pulled up to the gate, and by this this time. It was pitch black. I must have heard a noise that, uh, as a concrete beam started scraping across the top of the tank. I pulled myself 
down into the tank as it passed underneath that beam. The machine gun was snapped off its mount. It was dark as pitch dark. There were some fires burning, but it was pitch dark. Except there was a light on at the front gate. A light, a light came on at the front gate. And in the glare of that light, we could see figures moving, crouching figures. And looked at them, and they had helmets, and they had guns. And this kid next to me said, those are Americans. And there was this enormous roar from the main building. And this ocean of people poured out of the front entrance of the main building and swarmed around. You could see them in the glare of this light. And the light was clearly on a very large vehicle. They just swarmed around this vehicle, cheering and yelling, and we were cheering and yelling. And it was just overwhelming in a way. My dad ran from the shack to the front because somebody was saying the Americans are here. So he ran. And he took a look and saw the whole front plaza filled with these tanks and the searchlights and the things going up. And there was gunfire outside. And he ran back to the shack and said to my mother, I'm carrying you. The America, our boys are here. We all saved something for when our boys came in. That was the mantra. My mother saved a stubble of lipstick. She wouldn't use it until the boys came in. So my dad picked her up and ran out of the shack and she goes, wait, wait, <laughs> bring me back. And he said, no, no, we gotta go now. We, wanna, we don't wanna miss anything. She says, no, under the, the mattress is my lipstick. So he brings her back in, sits her down on the bed, takes the lipstick, and very carefully puts it on her. <laughs> then he picks her up, and off they go. We couldn't move. The captain had been walking alongside of the tank, along with the infantry, and uh, the internees grabbed him and got him up over their shoulders and carried him around. I'm thinking about these weakened people that could hardly move, and here they were showing so much strength and happiness. And so I said to Barney, my brother, I said, let's go join them. And a bunch of us said, yeah, okay, let's go join them. So we ran down the hall towards the steps that were led out of the building, closest to the main building. And there was a Japanese soldier there. He had a rifle and pointed at us and we couldn't leave. Um, so we went back to the room and uh, waited and watched. And there was clearly a great deal of activity going on outside. And we called out, there were American internees out in front of our building, and we told them we can't leave. The Japanese wouldn't let us leave. Word came that there was 60 Japs in the education building. So the captain told Hank to take the tank around and set up guard duty in front of the main uh, door. And then this kid came up to me and he said, you ought to look out the front. And it looked like the whole American army was out there. With tanks and trucks and howitzers and GIs all over the place. And machine guns pointed up at us. Uh, foxholes dug. And this kid said, look down there. And we looked out the window and right on the front steps of the Ed building, was this large tank with its gun pointed in the front door. So the next morning, at the first light, I stuck my head out of the uh, tank. I decided I'd do some shaving, 
and I was just there shaving away and I heard a voice. Hi, Basic! I looked up and there was a young boy hanging out the window and uh, we had quite a conversation. He says, be careful, he says this. Jap's still out there. And we started to talk to him. Here he was, a liberating soldier, and here we were, still in Japanese hands, just as we'd been for the past three years, not knowing what was coming next. The Brooks family, there were four of them, father, mother, and two young boys, twins. The father, a few weeks ago, died of starvation. The mother was killed by a Jap chef. Remaining of that family of four are just the two boys. Barney? Curtis. Oh, you're Curtis. Well, Curtis, I guess you know how everybody in this camp feels about the swell way you fellows have taken your troubles here. Yeah. And, uh, Barney, I, that goes for you, too. You've been a couple of swell American boys, and all 3,700 of us want you to know about that. Now, of course, you did have a lot of hard luck, all right. In addition to the rest of your hard luck, I think you were liberated a little after the rest of us? Yeah, a day and a half later. A day and a half later. Tell us about it. Well, the uh, Japanese, when the American tanks first came in, the Japanese retreated to our building and then decided to stay there. They, and the Americans didn't want to kill everybody in the building, so they just waited outside until the Japs decided to walk out. After They let them walk out after a party. Well, good luck to you, and I think that we can all say thanks to the American forces that came in here and liberated us before it got even worse than it was. And, of course, then I went to see my mother. <laughs> and uh, I can't imagine what she went through when, when after losing her husband a week before, uh, to have her two sons held hostage the night of liberation and having no idea whether she would ever see them again. So... Did she ever talk much about that? We hadn't much chance. We were liberated. We, we were freed uh, February 5th. Uh, she was killed February 7th. They said we were free to go outside. And my mother and I stood at the gate for almost a half an hour to really believe that we were free. Now it's almost 60 years. Uh, I think it is 60 years is enough time to forgive, but certainly not enough time to, to forget. It's, it's not long enough. 